the Florida Writer Podcast, a discussion about writing and other things. Hello, and welcome to another edition of the Florida Writer Podcast with your host, Allison Nissen. And today, I am lucky enough to be with Elliot Kleinberg. Elliot, could you give us a 60-second elevator pitch about who you are and what you write? Sure. I'm a son of a journalist. Between us, we worked for 72 years in the newspaper business in South Florida. He's going to be 90 in October, and he's still a better writer than me. Uh, I spent 40 years as a newspaper reporter. I've written a dozen books uh, all about Florida, related to Florida. Actually, I've published a dozen books. I've got two, uh, three or four that I'm now shopping around, all related to Florida. Uh, I also do a blog on bad writing called Something Went Horribly Wrong. And I do several talks around the state, again, mostly about Florida. Uh, I retired from the newspaper in December of 2020. uh, And of course, I'm just as busy as I ever was. And I am a Florida native. So now you can say you've actually seen one. I spent a lot of years in Lakeland and there were plenty, plenty of Florida natives there, let me tell you. But I I just, so you obviously you were introduced to writing um, from your father. Correct. Um, I tell people about going into the newsroom at the age of, you know, six or seven, which would have been around 1963, um, and watching the guys banging away on manual typewriters. Um, My mother said I was reading the labels of uh, ketchup bottles when I was about three or four. So um, I've been exposed all my life. Uh, I, at some point in college, I thought I wanted to be a lawyer, uh, but my friends uh, who had who were familiar with my writing said, are you crazy? Uh, you need to be a writer. So if they think you're such a great writer, and that was when you were first starting out, what was the genre that they were exposed to? Uh, you know, they would just, when, when you're in college, you're writing everything. Um, I was in the journalism curriculum at the University of Florida, uh, but uh, in addition to being uh, taking classes in news writing, of course, I was taking classes in feature writing. I was doing freelance for some of the local newspapers and magazines. And uh, so people, my buddies could see my writing. Uh, and so uh, they even said, uh, you know, this is what you should be doing. Well, it seems like you've been able to flourish writing. Yeah, um, I've been very fortunate. Um. I learned really at the foot of some some masters. My first newspaper job was at the Dallas Morning News, which is one of the largest papers in America. And I literally started, I mean, when they say you started in the mailroom, I started as a clerk in the newsroom opening the mail. And they started me writing little blurbs for the obituary lists. Uh, and uh, before I knew it, I was the chief police reporter in the eighth largest newspaper market in America. And uh, then I got a chance to come back to Florida, to the Palm Beach Post, where I spent 33 and a half years. Um, And, you know, young reporters and young creative writers tell me, what's the secret to good writing? And I always say, well, I'm going to tell you the secret, but you got to promise not to tell anyone. The secret is write, 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 and then read something somebody else wrote and then write some more. that, That is really good advice. It is hard sometimes to fit writing into your schedule. It is. Um, I remember when, uh, uh, of course, when I was a newspaper reporter, it's not exactly a nine to five job. Uh, And at the same time, I was raising two boys with my wife, who also had a full time job uh, as a banker, which isn't exactly a low level, low strain job either. And I remember around 2002, when I was working on the book on the great 1928 hurricane, uh, the book uh, Black Cloud, which was the one book that I got a national publisher uh, and it was pretty intense because I was writing a a, a really academic slash uh, general market book. It was very it was, a, it was the toughest writing job I'd ever done. And while I was writing that, my wife was studying for her certified financial planner license, and our boys were our boys were uh, you know in in middle school, and so we were doing more homework than they were, which was a little intimidating for them. So what is the future of newspapers? I'm very, very scared about the future of newspapers. Uh, People say to me all the time, well, you know, there's TV and there's the Internet. And I said, you don't understand. You need to understand something. When the local newspaper is gone, 
there is no other source of local news. I'm not worried about the TV people. And even my buddies in local TV will admit that local TV cannot cover a community like a newspaper can. They just can't do it. They don't have enough people. They're spread too thin. And they frankly can't put a reporter in a city council meeting for three hours and write the most important 10 paragraphs that are going to affect people. And people say to me, oh, I don't need a local newspaper. I said, well, you don't need it until you need it, until one day you get a tax bill that doesn't look right, or you're, or you're, uh, you're, they're tearing up the street in front of your house, or your granddaughter gets transferred to another school and she has to stand in the dark at five o'clock in the morning waiting for a bus. And then all of a sudden you call up these agencies and you say, when did you do this? And they said, well, we had big public meetings. It was in the paper. Oh, there is no paper. So I'm very, very concerned. Oh, that's an interesting thought. I hadn't, I hadn't really thought about the public announcements part of, of the newspaper business. I know, um, you know, I know locally it's important to really pay attention to uh, the issues that are, you know, surrounding your community and, and it, it's everything from your taxes and your schools and, and um, traffic patterns, you know, uh, new housing developments. I'm, I'm based in Houston and we just have housing left and right going everywhere. Yeah. And they'll say, well, we had a public meeting, public meeting. you know, five people showed up. So, yeah. Well, yeah. frankly, I'm not worried about, I'm not worried about Houston as much as I'm worried about Waco. I'm not so worried about Tampa as much as I'm worried about Lakeland. The bigger city newspapers are going to survive somehow, but there's all these, they call them news deserts. And there's hundreds of them around the country where there's just no newspaper is covering it. You know, the Tampa paper used to have a Lakeland bureau. They don't have any more. My newspaper, the Palm Beach Post, had a dozen bureaus all up and down the coast from Vero Beach all the way down to Miami. They don't have any bureaus anymore. So what's happening in those towns? You don't know. And it's not just keeping the politicians honest, although that's a big part of it. It's just telling people about some pioneer who died or letting them know about a historic home that's about to get knocked down, or to let them know what time the parade is or when the turkey dinner is. This is all stuff that a newspaper does. They, are the, they, are the, they, they, they keep the community together. And when they're gone, good luck with that. And people say, oh, I get my local news from the internet. And I said, well, who's giving it to you? Who on the internet is giving it to you? Is it the reporter that sat in the back of the city council meeting for three hours? No, it's my neighbor. And I said, well, what you're doing is the 21st century equivalent of getting gossip from your neighbor across the fence, which is absolutely worthless. Yes. So I'm just going to switch topics a slight little bit. And you have sure. a blog about bad writing. I believe it's called Something Went Horribly Wrong. Uh, tell me about that. First of all, the title is fabulous. Yeah. Um, my college buddies, and I'm, again, I'm returning to them, will confirm that when I was in the frat in college, they would put notices on the bulletin board about needing a ride home or having an extra ticket to the Gators game or needing a ticket to the Billy Joel concert. And I would be marking them up with a red pen. I am not kidding. So I was doing that way, I guess because my dad worked on the copy desk. When I was a reporter, um, I can tell you that the copy desk saved my career many, many times. Um, you know, I'd get a phone call at 11 o'clock at night and they, it'd be, hey, it's Luann. Um, I think your math is wrong on this tax story. You just, your math says these people are getting a tax break and are not. I used to always kid with our cutter about all the mistakes that we would see and we would laugh about them. Some of them were hilarious. Uh, TV especially makes a lot of mistakes and they'll admit it, uh, but that doesn't make it okay. Um, but newspapers made plenty of grammatical mistakes too. And some of them were pretty funny. So right before I retired, I said to one of my copy editors, Luann Freyla, who again saved my career, um, Luann, when, when we retire, I'm gonna do a blog and I'll write it, but you be my copy editor just like you did in the old days. Um, to make sure that when I write about a mistake, that it's really a mistake, because you can imagine me saying something was a mistake and it turns out it wasn't. So Luann's my rules committee. So I started the blog about a month after I retired. I posted it in January of 2021. 
And um, I'm getting, you know, a, a small following. It's just starting. Uh, there's other grammar blogs, but mine's done with a little bit of, you know, my, my kids say, well, you, aren't you being a little snarky? And I said, well, we never identify who made the mistake. We always black out anything identifying because we're not there to humiliate people. We're there to teach. And what I say in the blog is that um, people judge you by the way you talk and the way you write. There was a, a, some outfit that used to do a commercial that said that. And people say, well, there's no, there's no police to tell me that I got my grammar wrong. It's nobody's business if I want to write something that the grammar is not perfect. And I said, look, would you ever go to a black tie affair wearing orange socks? And they say, oh, of course not. That would make me look stupid. And I say, aha. So you won't go to the black tie affair wearing orange socks, but you have a, 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 a mat in front of your door that says the Smith's apostrophe S, yes, which makes you look stupid. So that's the idea of the blog. And we've been doing it now. You know, uh, what we do is we do a, I'll do a segment one week every other week. And in the off week, I do what's called the grammar police where people send in examples of stupid signs and highway signs and stuff on TV that they, and the letters they get in the mail that are have all these grammatical errors. And of course, the two biggest sins that I talk about, uh, one is uh, cliches, which are horrible. Uh, actually, three cliches and misplaced modifiers, like I shot an elephant in my pajamas, the famous Groucho Marx line. And then the other big thing, and um, I talk about this a lot, uh, and it's the thing I'm going to be talking about at the Florida Writers Conference, is tight writing. Uh, because tight writing or failing to write tight is one of the great sins of writing. It's it's not a it's not a blatant sin, uh, but it really makes your writing better when you write tight. And so, let's talk about writing tight. How what, what's the first if someone is a little bit of a meander, what would the first thing be to start to create tighter copy? Well, one of the best ways to be a good uh, testifier is to admit that you're also uh, you also did it. You're uh, one time uh, one of the coaches at the newspaper would have these monthly sessions. One of the, one of the editors would have a monthly sessions where they would coach people on writing. And one time he came in and he said, "Okay, guys." I took all the writers. This is when I was in the, one of the bureaus. So there are only about 10 writers. I took all the, I took everybody's leads for the last month and measured them to see who had the longest and wordiest lead day in and day out on average. And it wasn't even close. It was me. And I was mortified. And at the time I was working on the book about the hurricane. So I went back to my manuscript and I said, holy cow, it's like your, your, your eyes light up. And I just went in and I just started cutting sentences in half and sometimes setting, cutting sentences in thirds. And what, I, and, and, and the, what, the, what the coaches used to tell us was, now remember, I was in a newspaper where you had a hole in the paper, a space that was not negotiable. And so if you wrote something, if your writing was too wordy, then you had to leave out important facts. But the editor said, you know, if you write a little tighter, you can get that little fact in there and your story will be better. And of course, you're like, aha. So what I tell people is when they write a book and they ask people, oh, did you like the book? And the person will say, and my wife's in all is in a book club and I, you know, I, I talk to her book club people all the time. and They give me wonderful feedback and they'll say, well, I don't know what it was about the book. It just slogged. It was just slow. I just... And eventually I lost interest and quit reading. And so what the reader is really talking about, although they can't say it, they don't know, you know, it's, it's kind of a subliminal thing. But what happened was they were reading a book that wasn't written tight. And I'm not talking about big sections that go off into the, you know, into the ether, although that's a big crime. I'm talking about little things where they say in 20 words what they could have said in eight and so the reader subliminally is like he's walking through knee deep snow and, and they're like, come on already, come on already. And they don't know why it's taking so long. But we know as writers is that the person is taking too long. And sometimes it's little things like saying, I fell on the floor instead of I fell because where else are you going to fall? You know, you are unless you specify that you fell on a couch, it's presumed that you're falling on the floor. So just say, I fell or say, 
Instead of saying, I heard bells ringing, just say bells rang. And people are saying, well, that's just a little bit, a word here and there. I said, well, you add up all these words and all of a sudden you've said in, a, in 220 words what you were saying in 300. And all of a sudden your story is tighter, it's moving along and people are gonna stay engaged. And the analogy I use beside, you know, I use a couple analogies. One is imagine that your editor gave you so many words and every word after that, you got to pay out of your pocket. Or imagine that you're writing a telegram like they did in the old days where you had to pay by the word. And the other analogy is imagine you're making a big soup and it's really good and everybody loves it. You want to make more soup for, for more people. So you add water to the soup. Well, now you have more soup, but it's not as good because you've watered it down. So uh, I've, I, to this day, I, I just finished writing a uh, trilogy of three novels that I'm now got some agents looking at, keep your fingers crossed. And after I wrote the three novels, and they're not long novels, they're each about 50,000 words. After I went through them, uh, I came back a week later and just started cutting and tightening and cutting and tightening and changed. I have seen to, I saw and changed. I fell to the ground to, I fell. And all of a sudden in each case, I took a thousand words out of the book. So it can be done. All of a sudden you're going to go back and look at your book and say, man, this book is moving a lot better now. And that's the secret. I love that secret. That is, it is wonderful advice. Thank you for sharing that. Elliot Kleinberg, how could people find out more about your blog and how can they get in touch with you? Very simple. www.ekfla.com. Ekfla.com. Real easy. All right. And are you ready to switch to our rapid fire questions? Heck yeah. Do you have a favorite mug you like to drink a hot beverage from? Of course, Florida Gators. Do you like to type on a manual typewriter? You know, I started on a manual typewriter. Um, it's not productive to work on a manual typewriter, but I collect manual typewriters. I have about half a dozen. And if you go to my webpage, there's a little blurb that I typed on a manual typewriter that I use as my identifying photo. They're a lot of fun. I'm, I'm glad that people are saving them. Tom Hanks saves them too. And so I, I'm hoping we can get together sometime. Well, that sounds like a good idea. And what is next on your bucket list? Well, uh, I'm hoping to get these uh, novels, uh, to find a, a publisher for these three novels that I wrote. I created a 1920s Miami police detective. And I've got him chasing uh, rum runners and ga uh, 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 gangsters uh, through South Florida and the state of Florida in the 20s and 30s. I had a blast writing it. Um, and uh, uh, if it takes off, there's a there might be a whole franchise in that. I'm, I know I'm getting away from myself, but you can hope a person can hope. Uh, and if that doesn't work, I've got some other fiction on my plate. Um, I've got some additional nonfiction. All my books up until now have been nonfiction. Um, I've got some additional nonfiction projects. I love my talks. Um, now that we're kind of getting past the pandemic, the talks are really uh, kicking up. And, and some of them are, most of them are related to Florida, but some of them are also connected to my blog. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, 66 is the new 40. So I don't intend to slow down uh, at all. Um, I'm taking some time off to do some great traveling with my ride of 39 years, which is as important as the writing. Uh, so I'm, again, I'm as busy as I ever was. Well, Elliot Kleinberg, thank you so much for stopping by. Well, thank you for having me. You have been listening to another edition of the Florida Writer Podcast with your host, Allison Nissen. Allison out. Boom. We're all done. Elliot Kleinberg was born in South Florida, spent nearly half a century in daily journalism before retiring in December 2020 after a 33 and a half year career at the Palm Beach Post in West Palm Beach. In addition to covering local news, he also wrote extensively about Florida and Florida history. For more information about Elliot, visit his website at ekfla.com and subscribe to his blog, Something Went Horribly Wrong. For more information about the Florida Writers Association, visit us at floridawriters.com. Dot net. Until next time.